Hello. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've been in this room. Well, for preaching, anyway. Um, turn to the passage that uh, Pastor David read, if you want to follow along. Uh, the city that I grew up in had uh, quite a few hospitals. The city itself wasn't that big, but uh, we were surrounded by um, military bases, and uh, we actually had several uh, hospitals that were there just for the military base. Um, uh, Roper Hospital, where my siblings and I were all born, uh, St. Francis Hospital, Catholic Hospital, now combined with Roper, the Medical University Hospital, the Trident Hospital was for those in the military, Veterans Hospital for those who were in the military, the Naval Hospital just for those in that branch of the military, and since I've left the Mount Pleasant Hospital. When someone is injured, uh, especially in an accident, some kind of emergency typically, uh, they go to one of those hospitals, uh, and, uh, but they don't go to admissions and sit in admissions until they can be processed. They're taken to the emergency room of the hospital uh, where they are triaged. That word, which I only learned by watching medical shows, never heard it before, uh, was actually um, adopted from something that Napoleon in 1792 came up with. And uh, the word's from the French term that means to sort out. And... Uh, it's too bad it took that long for military folk to figure out that it's a very helpful way to take care of soldiers who are injured on the field to actually bring them to a place where they can be sorted out and where they can be uh, taken care of according to their particular need. Uh, so in the emergency room, people are triaged there, and that means they're sorted out and the right kind of uh, allocation of treatment is given to them. Um, the reason I mention this is because the local church should be a kind of hospital for the spiritual needs of people, not the physical needs of folks, but it's a place where uh, believers can be uh, strengthened, can be tended to for any spiritual injury, and um, especially a church like ours that has a ministry uh, like Freedom That Lasts, an addictions ministry, that would be our emergency room where we give spiritual triage. The more mature believers in the church uh, function just like doctors and nurses, and in some cases, in these emergencies, spiritually speaking. Folks come to Lighthouse who have life-dominating sins, and they get saved, and they need more particular attention than others do. And uh, so it's, it's that need that we have not only to learn how to help others in need, but I think to do a little self-medicating spiritually, that I depart from uh, Matthew 24 and 25, much to Merget's chagrin. Uh, I have to tell you all, some people have heard about it. Yeah, I heard about this. What's going on? He asked me to address 
Not this particular passage in Matthew 24 and 25, but the idea of eschatology one year ago this month. And I'm just getting around to it. And I told him Thursday night at class, I'm, I'm not going to do it this Sunday. And uh, I think he thought in his mind, I couldn't see and he didn't say it, but uh, again, pastor, again, you're going to leave where we're supposed to be? Yes, I am. Uh, and I'm uh, turning our attention to 1 John chapter 2, just verses 3 through 6. I had pastor read verses 1 through 6, but this pastor, or this passage rather, not only gives us spiritual doctors and nurses some excellent suggestions for helping people, treating others, but also, as I mentioned, for self-medicating ourselves. These four verses I've divided into three sections, the experience of assurance in verses 3 and 4, the fruit of assurance in verse 5, and then finally the expectation of assurance in verse 6. And so guess what the theme is? Yes, very good. I heard some of you whisper it. Yes, assurance is our theme. Now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And you know, the last phrase, which seems so stark, those aren't even John's words. That's what the Holy Spirit put on his heart to write down here. So what is the theme? First John's often called the epistle of assurance because it tells us how we can know or how we can have the assurance that we are saved. Although John never uses the word saved, which is part of his development of the theme. The Apostle John is the author of this little epistle, 105 verses. He was the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, and one of the two sons of thunder. They were called this because their approach to Christian work is just kill everybody and then sort out the problems afterwards. Uh, and did I hear somebody say amen? That is not the right thing to amen. Yes. Uh, freedom that lasts would be freedom that does not last because everybody's dead. Uh, well, the theme of assurance is recognized by the repetition of the English word no, K-N-O-W. The words for knowledge occur 41 times in the epistle, 105 verses, 41 times these terms occur. In our passage, four times, once in each verse, actually twice in the first one, but four times in four verses. That's uh, a great deal of repetition. So the believer's knowledge is the big theme of this book. Now, I would encourage you to just uh, take about a half an hour, sit down and read all five chapters, maybe make a mark under everywhere that uh, the word no occurs in your Bible. Um, the primary term for this, gnosko is the Greek word, refers to a knowledge that we gain by experience. Uh, the other term, pronounced oida, uh, that's the kind of knowledge that we gain um, intuitively. It's, uh, it's a perfect knowledge. It, it occurs to us intuitively. Um, for instance, one of the things I can know, verse 3, is that I know God. By the way, all four of the no's in our passage are all knowing by experience. By this, I come to have the assurance 
That's the first no. That I know God. The second one <clears throat> refers to salvation. It is one of the ways that the Apostle John says uh, that I'm saved. By this I have the assurance that I am born again, that I am saved. And uh, that's where we're going to launch out. Uh, the Apostle John uses 22 different expressions, 22, uh, to describe being saved in this little epistle. Four of them have fellowship with God as one, knowing God, like in our verse here, being born of God and loving God all point to a person having a relationship with God. Uh, there are 22 different expressions, but they fit into three categories. They either refer to a person who has a relationship with God, or they refer to a person who is changing or who has been transformed, both on the inside as well as on the outside. And then finally, it refers to someone who has life. Salvation is life. Salvation is change. And salvation is a relationship. And that's what John is driving out throughout his driving at throughout his epistle. Uh, that salvation is not somebody coming forward in a service. It's not somebody signing a card saying they prayed a prayer. It's not somebody just praying a prayer. It's not somebody who feels religious or says they're spiritual. It's somebody who has a relationship with God. Not somebody who knows a little bit about God. Somebody who actually has a relationship with the person of God. Somebody who is changed because salvation changes people. It's not change that we make by our effort. It's change that God makes in us. And it's life that he gives to us because every single human being on earth, apart from salvation, is dead in trespasses and sins. Now, our concern is what it says in verse 3, that uh, the way for us to know that we have eternal light, or the way that for us to know that we uh, have salvation, that we know God, is if we keep His commandments. Where are His commandments found? In the Bible. Some people say this is a reference to the commands of Christ, where would we find the commands of Christ? Well, we find them spoken by him in the Gospels. We find them referred to constantly in the book of Acts. We find them expounded and explained in the epistles. So throughout the New Testament, uh, and the way we have the assurance that we're saved is because there's a new obedience in our lives. There is a keeping, there's an obedience to, there's a regard for the commandments of God that we've never had before. Sometimes unsaved people will have a certain regard for the commandments of God because they think if they do the best they can to obey God's commands, then they'll go to heaven. That's not true. You can do the best you can to obey the commands of God for your whole life. You can give away all of your possessions and die and go to hell. Because that is not the way to know that you have eternal life. But then look at verse 4. He who says, I know him, I'm saved, and does not keep his commandments... That person is not saved. He is a liar. And inside of that person, there is no truth. So, 
we come then to explain assurances success, verse 3, and assurances failure in verse 4. Verse 3 tells the reader how he or she succeeds in having assurance that they're saved, having uh, what, would we, what else would we call this? Having the certainty of knowledge. I remember after I became a Christian, I uh, was telling uh, my family, my father didn't live at home. He had left my mom in our home and remarried, and so I went to see him at his office, and I said, Dad, I just wanted to tell you uh, that I am saved. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. And he looked up from his work. He slammed his fists on the desk, and he said, How dare you call me a sinner? <laughs> and I'm thinking, Is that what I said? I don't think that's what I said. <laughs> but in his mind, how could you know you're going to heaven? when you've been so good in the way you've lived your life, so selfless, so devoted to God, that God would say, you know, you're a special person. I think I'm going to let you into heaven. You're just too good to pass up. Now, I had no idea about that being the way you got to heaven, I believed in Jesus Christ because he died for all my sins. And when I trusted him as Savior, all of those sins were put on him. And all of his goodness and righteousness was put on me. I didn't deserve heaven. He imputed his righteousness to me so that the Father would accept me for Jesus' sake. Now, praise God, my dad did get saved. How do we succeed in being able to say, I know that I am saved. I'm absolutely certain that I am born again. Do you know there are people in certain religions that will say, you cannot know that in spite of what 1 John says. By the way, it says it repeatedly as we're going to see. We all have, can have, the certainty of our salvation, the certainty of knowing that God completely accepts us in this life, not after we die and go stand before Him. We are accepted in this life. And how can we know that that change has taken place in us. We can know that he will receive us to himself when we die and leave this earth into heaven by keeping his commandments. But that's not a way to heaven. That's an evidence that we're already going there. Because God has made such a change in us for the first time in our lives, we love his commandments because we love him. And we long to obey them out of gratitude for him saving us. We don't do it to get saved. We do it because we already are saved. We don't do it to make God like us. The moment we trust Christ as Savior, He loves us with an everlasting love. We do what we do because we love Him. Now this phrase, keeping God's commandments. Let me talk about what that means because this can be confusing. As a young believer... I would come before the Lord and I said, Lord, thank you so much for saving me, but my heart is so convicted because every time I come, I can always think of commandments that I've not kept. Now, I know things have changed, but I certainly have not kept your commandments perfectly. Well, it cannot mean in the first place that we are passive in our desire to obey God. 
It cannot mean that we're just going to wait for God to make us obey His commands. If we just wait long enough, He's going to do this for us and we won't have to cooperate with Him at all. He's just going to come and bang, we all of a sudden are living holy lives effortlessly on our part. That is not the case. It can't mean that. Why? Because hundreds of times we Christians are commanded to obey the Lord in the way we behave, in the way we conduct ourselves, in how we live our lives. If I'm commanded to do it, isn't it expected that I'm going to have to obey for myself? Now, He's going to give me strength and grace to obey, as we're going to talk about. But it can't mean that he's going to make me keep his commandments without me doing anything. Number two, neither can it mean that I must obey all of God's commands flawlessly, since that is impossible biblically. In fact, my wife and I were just reading yesterday in the Proverbs And there's a rhetorical question asked in Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sins. Now, it's a rhetorical question, which means it expects a definite answer. And what's the definite answer? Who can say that? I no longer sin. Who says that? Nobody. Nobody. So... If it's biblically impossible, that's what it can't mean. That raises the question, what does it mean? What does God want me to do to demonstrate that His eternal life is inside of me? His Holy Spirit is residing as the uh, sign of our covenant together, uh, our agreement and relationship together. It does mean, number one, having a new desire, one that I've never had before when I, before I get saved. I have a new desire to obey God. It means that I have a love for His Word, the Bible. It means that I long for His individual leadership in everything. As a young Christian, I didn't even realize I was following God's leadership. I wanted to go to study for the priesthood. I was raised in the Catholic Church, and so when you were serious about God, I assumed that meant you would go be a priest. So I went to the pastor of our church. I didn't know he was a pastor. called him father for about five months. Um, Where do you go to be a priest? And he said, well, I think you mean pastor, and you go to Bible school, and... It occurred to me that, okay, this is something the Lord wants me to do. This is a way in which He's leading me. This is His will for me. I wanted to do that. Not in order to make God like me, but because He already loved me with an everlasting love. And I wanted to uh, make my life available to Him completely. But it also means keeping his commandments, having the evidence of repentance, which is hating all sin, wishing you would never commit sin again, turning from sin in our hearts as well as in our actions, and a new direction of life, though it is never perfect in this life. There is a definite change going on inside a person. And that change works its way to the outside. But with all of this going on and with God working in me, I will never do it perfectly, just like Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 9 says. You know you are keeping God's commands when you can agree with Paul. When in Romans chapter 7 he said... Paul said this, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, 
but I do the very thing I hate doing. I do what I do not want, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right. There's a Christian. I have a longing to do the right thing. I hate doing the wrong thing, but I find myself pulled in that direction to do the wrong thing. <clears throat> he says, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Now, those of you who have known the Lord any length of time, you understand this. You want to change. God has made a change in your heart. You want to obey Him. You want to keep His commands. But there is still this part of me that loves sin and does not want to leave it. And so there's a conflict. There's a war going on inside of us. Put another way, we have the assurance that we're saved when we struggle against sin. When we want to turn away from the pleasures of sin for a season, I do not always win the struggle, but it ought to encourage us to know that the struggle is there because if I were lost, I would not mind sinning. If you think you're a Christian and you still like sinning, and it doesn't make any difference what kind it is, you think it's okay to lose your temper, you think it's okay to violate the land's laws, you think it's perfectly fine for you to lie, cheat, steal, whatever you feel like doing, you feel like justifying, then there's been no change in your life. And you are still lost. Verse 4, he that says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments, that person is a liar. And that person has no truth inside of him. But what about the other end of the spectrum? Well, that's what I just referred to here. What, uh, when does assurance fail? Verse 4 tells the reader that uh, uh, what has to happen to fail to have assurance. In other words, how, how, do I, how do I say to myself, I don't think I'm saved. This is not happening inside of me. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So that's how it fails. We don't keep his commandments. There's been no change within. There is no love for God or for his words. There are two occasions on which assurance fails, but only one of them is mentioned here by John. Assurance fails when a person's profession of faith is false. This is a pretty common thing in religion all around the world. People are always saying, I'm a Christian. But either they don't understand what a Christian is, or they don't understand how to become one. Perhaps they've been raised in religion and uh, they think that makes them a Christian, or some people say, well, of course I'm a Christian. I'm a Canadian. All Canadians are Christians. Um, all kinds of things that people say. But here's a fellow in verse 4. He claims to be saved. He who says, I know him. In an emotional excitement, perhaps. Perhaps to please another person, he or she makes a profession of faith in Christ. What do I have to do? Just go up to the front. And you go up to the front and they give you a card to sign. They ask what your name is. And they say on this date, Bob prayed to get saved. And uh, they give you a Bible and praise the Lord. You're on your way to heaven. But what was going on inside your heart when you did all that stuff? What were you thinking in your mind when you did all that stuff? I had a good friend who made a profession of faith in front of my pastor, and right in front of me, prayed. Uh, but on the way home from that, he told me, I'm not telling anybody, and don't you tell anybody, 
I was just saying what I said to make the pastor leave me alone. That was his profession. So, so all kinds of reasons, but uh, what happened on the inside? Well, he was just lying. Um, he didn't mean anything of what he said. Uh, he begins to make a claim. Um, and I said, look, I, I already referred to this before. Uh, often people want God to give them eternal life, but they don't want to get rid of their sins, so they think they can have both. So, yes, I'll pray to get saved, and I'll just hang on to my sins. Well, you can do that, but guess which one of them is not going to happen? You cannot be accepted by God. You cannot pray and ask Him to save you, and then ask Him quietly, can I still hang on to my sin and be saved? Because He will say, no. So, uh, what does John say in verse 4 about this person? That he's a liar and the truth is not in him. By the way, that's one of John's expressions for salvation. When the truth is not inside of you. When Christ is not inside of you. The Spirit does not dwell in you. Those are all expressions that refer to this relationship. But assurance also fails when the person is genuinely saved, but gives in to the sin and loses his understanding of God's approval of him, loses the joy of her experience, if it's a her, his experience of assurance. This happened to David, puffed up with his kingly position. He took Bathsheba, and then to cover it up, he resorted to murdering her husband, Uriah. For more than a year, David tried to keep the sin covered up. He refused to repent. But in 2 Samuel 11, verse 27, there's this ominous statement, but... I mean, it looked like he had succeeded. Uriah, the husband, was dead. Bathsheba no longer is married. Uh, David takes her to himself, and she has a baby by him. The night he committed adultery with her, that's when she got pregnant. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. You say, well, how did he know about it? God knows everything. God knows every single thing, every single human being says, does, or even thinks. And we are called to account in eternity for that. And we either have Jesus as our Savior from all that sin, or we pay for it by going to hell forever. So, David describes what it was like to have no joy of his assurance in Psalm 32. He begins the psalm by saying, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. What about before he was forgiven? What about when he wasn't confessing? What about when he was trying to cover it up? Well, obviously... Proverbs hadn't been written yet, but Proverbs says the one who covers his sins will not succeed. But the one who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. He says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered over. Again, what about the time when it was not covered over? Was he blessed then? No, listen. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Now David wasn't concerned that he was going to lose his salvation. David was concerned that he had no joy in the Lord. He was concerned that the joy of that assurance was not his. He says, blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no deceit. 
And when was there deceit in his spirit? There was deceit when he took Bathsheba. There was deceit when he invited Uriah to come back from the battle. There was deceit when he told Joab to put Uriah in a place in the battle where he was sure to die at the hands of the enemy. What he did was wicked. There was deceit in his heart. Now he does say, blessed is the man in whom there is no deceit, in whose spirit there is no deceit. But there was deceit for David for a while. For when I kept silent, when I refused to confess, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, and he's talking about God. God's hand, God's, God's a burden upon him uh, was heavy upon me. He said, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Don't know if you've ever been to Israel before, but uh, we were there the day we visited a... Uh, a uh, tourist place called Masada, a, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the term, uh, a, a, like a big castle he built on the top of this mountain. Uh, uh, Masada is a term for fortress, that's what it was, a big fortress. Um, it was 126 degrees. And I'll tell you, you think it's hot here? Not a bit. Uh, it's that kind of heat that saps your strength very, very quick. And he said, that's what happened. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer. And what caused that? He was trying to hide from God. He was trying to cover up his sins. He was trying not to confess. And that takes away the joy of our assurance so that we don't have it. See, not keeping his commandments, not lying about being saved, but simply deciding, I think I'm just going to indulge my life in sin. So that leads us to verse 5, the fruit of assurance, which is maturity. He who keeps his word, and notice the word in front, but there's a contrast here. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. By this we know that we're saved. The one who keeps his word, and as a result, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So what is the fruit of assurance? Continuing to keep God's word, having a posture of obedience toward God and an overall direction of life toward God indicates that this person is genuinely saved. What do we expect from that? What is the fruit of a saved person's life? Truly, that person's love for God is brought to maturity, is brought to the word perfection in the New Testament, the end result doesn't, mean, uh, doesn't refer to a flawless uh, perfection the way we tend to think of it. But uh, pull an apple off the tree and say, boy, this apple is perfect. Look at it closer. It's not, but it is mature. It is ripe. It is ready to eat. That's the way they use the term perfect here. What do we expect from the fruit of a saved person. Uh, that person's love for God grows and grows and matures and strengthens and redirects itself to the right thing, and it is perfected, it is matured. How does John describe the Christian salvation? Uh, as loving God. This is something that happens to us when we're saved. We learn to love the Lord. We learn to follow the Lord. Our love of God will continue to grow despite our failures. This is like Paul saying in Philippians 3, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, that is Christ-likeness. I press on to make it my own being like Christ. 
because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not count or I do not consider myself that I have already made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The goal toward which we press all our lives is being more like him and more like him and more like him. The promises or the promise of maturity in our faith ought to be an encouragement to us in our struggle against sin. Why? Because by this growth in grace, we know that we are in Christ and we know that we are genuinely saved. Now, I wouldn't encourage you to go out and fail and say, this is teaching me good things. No, but it ought not discourage us from trying to live for God if we fail. And then finally, in verse 6, the expectation of assurance. He who says he abides in him. Here's another one of our expressions in the book of 1 John for uh, someone being saved. The one who says, I'm in God. In fact, I continue in God. Ought himself also to walk just as he walked person who claims to be saved is expected to behave in the same general way that Jesus behaved. You know, that's one of the things that's going to make heaven so nice. Uh, there is no sin there. And in fact, there is no curse that came down through Adam to us. There are no tears there is no sickness, there is no death, and it's not a place where we're left to our evil devices to sin all we want. No, nope. you can't do that there because there is no sin there. I preached a whole series of sermons on why unsaved people don't want to go to heaven. And they don't because they love sin. There's no sin there. You want to go to heaven just so you can live a life of sin without ever having any consequences of it? Don't make the rest of us unhappy. So, we're going to be aided. Um, or how is, how is it going to be aided to us that we behave like Christ? Uh, we know what he's like. We know what he's like because several years ago, Several years ago, we started a series on the life of Christ. And it helps us to know what kinds of things does Christ like? What kinds of things does he do? What did he do that he expects me to do? A good question to ask when you're reading through the Gospels. What did he do in this portion that I read that he expects me to do also. And then, of course, we have to walk as he walked. What does that mean? Well, walking is a common expression in the New Testament for day-to-day -day behavior. Think of Romans 6.4, walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5.7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And in Ephesians chapter 5, walk as children of light. Behave this way. Live day by day this way. And that brings us to all of our application. It's just really a long conclusion. I need to understand assurance. Because assurance is going to help me grow in my Christian life. And a lack of assurance is going to keep you from growing in your Christian life. Number one, and there are six of these, a growing assurance will lead to a growing victory over sin. Just as growing victory over sin, a growing victory over sin, will lead to a growing assurance. 
You need the assurance. And God wants to give it to you if there's his life in your soul. Number two, assurance is not something a person can give you. God must do that. Even if the person directs your attention to the right place. You're not going to understand very much of 1 John until you understand the whole concept of living for Him. God must do the assuring. Knowing that you are truly born again is verified by the evidences mentioned in 1 John. It was a year ago July that we went through these in 1 John. I know that I'm saved if I no longer practice sin the way I did before I was saved. Rather, I have a newly given hatred of sin and love for doing right. That's the first evidence. If that's true of me, then that's an indication I truly am saved. Number two, I genuinely love other Christians if I'm truly saved. You know, before I was saved, my mother was a Christian and uh, she had to leave our home over one New Year's time because her mother was ill in Florida and she had to go down there and tend to her, but she had promised her church that they could have a New Year's Eve service in our house. We don't have a big house and it's a lot smaller with 60 people wandering around inside. And you know what bugged me the most? All these Christian fellows had short hair. Oh, why? This was 1975. Only weirdos had short hair, right? And I did not want to be around them. Neither did my older sister. Neither did my older brother. And one time in our attempt to get away from them, we all found ourselves right at the coat closet by the front door. Where can you go? They're everywhere in here. But when I get saved, I genuinely love other Christians. Number three, I want to stand apart from the unsaved of the world. I don't want to live like they do. I don't want to think the way that they do. I want to think like a Christian. I want to live like Jesus did. That's an indication that we're truly saved. That's an evidence. I openly my... I openly confess my faith in the truth about Jesus. Not only am I a Christian, I believe he is God and not just a human being. I believe he is the only Savior. I believe he said the things the New Testament says he said. I believed when he died, I believe that when he died, it wasn't just a human death, but he was bearing the sin of the world on his shoulders and on his heart to rescue sinners from damnation. I want to submit, as an evidence of salvation, I want to submit to God's word. I want to obey its commands as being uh, obedience. They're commands for me. They're not suggestions. None of the Ten Commandments are suggestions. I live and die by those things, by those statements. And then finally, I see evidence that the Holy Spirit does reside within me and is changing me on the inside and from the inside and on the outside as well. The means of grace are important if I'm to have assurance of my salvation. What do you mean by the means of grace? That is, uh, taking in the word of God, communion with God in prayer. Now, I grew up in a church. I knew how to say prayers. As a matter of fact, I could rattle them off quicker than anyone I knew. Why? Because nothing was going between my ears. It was all just spouting off prayers. That's not prayer. That's not prayer. (laughs) Prayer is really talking to a real God who really listens to us when we really talk to him. That's what prayer is. 
taking in the word of God, real communion with God in prayer, fellowship with other Christians, fellowship about the things of God, will strengthen my walk with the Lord and diminish my love of sin. So I just don't think I can ever quit. Do these things. Double up on these things. Do them much more than you're doing now. It will cause the things of this world to grow strangely dim in the light of Jesus' glory and grace. Accountability to each other. This is number four. I know you thought I had a lot more already, but no, this is only number four. Accountability to each other is the evidence you are spirit-filled. Uh, that's straight from Ephesians 5. Uh, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he gives three evidences, and one of them is submitting yourselves one to another. So accountability, that's what that is, is an evidence that we are Spirit-filled. Always place, Let's always place ourselves under spiritual authority. And you say, well, that, that's easy for you to say. You're a pastor. You're not under anybody's authority. Oh, yes, I am. And he's sitting right there on the front row. And he's not the only one. I'm under the authority of every single other elder in this church. I'm under the authority of the deacons in this church. And outside of this church, I have a mission organization that I'm a member of, and they are an authority over me. I even still have a sending church. Hadn't been my church for 33 years, but I still have a submission to them as authority. Say, do I need that? If you want to be a servant for God, yes. Yes, we all need that. If you're not under anyone's spiritual authority, you are disobeying God. Generally speaking, here's number five, you are much worse than you think you are. Generally speaking, you and me, <laughs> we are much worse than we think we are. You have the idea, oh, I'm a pretty good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. And no one's going to stand before God and say that. Not even Moses. Not even Paul the Apostle. No one. Why? Because we are much worse than we think we are. Therefore, avoid inappropriate introspection. And that is, what's going on inside of me? Oh, I'm such a terrible person. You know, that kind of denigration is just pride in reverse. I'm so bad. I'm so bad. Isn't that great that I admit that I'm so bad? Uh, that's all that is. No, that's inappropriate introspection. Avoid that. Don't do that. You don't look within to encourage yourself. Always be looking away to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down on the right hand of God. We look away to him who took away all our sins from us. And then finally, and this really is the last one, don't fall into the trap of loving the gifts of God, that he gives us victory over sin, that he gives us provision of material needs, that he gives us human friendships. Don't fall into the trap of loving the gifts that God gives without loving the giver. Our focus should be on God. And he is not good because of what he gives us. He is good because he is God. And he deserves all my devotion just because he is who he is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful assurance that you give to us. We thank you, Lord, that you give it in spite of our failures because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we love him for doing that for us, and we love you 
for choosing us and working in our hearts. We, we love you for sending him to rescue us from ourselves. And we pray that you would rescue more from themselves by persuading them of the truthfulness of your word. And Lord, there is a change that you make in us when you save us. And there may be some here this morning who've never experienced that kind of change. A change from loving wickedness to loving righteousness. Oh God, work, I pray. You are the only one who can save. There is no talking anyone into going to heaven. You have to open their hearts to pay attention to the things that are spoken from your word, just like you did, Lydia, in the Bible. And I pray that you would work in our hearts. Help us, Lord, not to be weary with well-doing. Help us to always strive for uh, that expression of gratitude. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us a future with you. Thank you for giving us lives that will count for eternity and not just for time. And Lord, I pray that you would renew your grace in our hearts, that we would strive with greater zeal as a result of this reminder. In Jesus' name, amen.